Our second lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 26, verses 1 through 10. And it is Matthew's version of the Easter story. Let us hear now the word of God. 28, excuse me. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has been raised, as he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy, gracious, and loving God, we are so grateful for Easter, for your resurrection, for the stone that was rolled away not so Jesus could get out, but so that we could see that it was empty. God, we ask now that your spirit will break through the stones of our heart, roll away the stone that your spirit may grow us up in you, may grow us in love for you, and help us to see you, God, as you so often flip our expectations on their head. Lord, use this time so that our worship of you be sincere and true, and that we may grow from it, and our love for you and for one another, that when we leave this place, we will leave loving you a bit more. Because what matters is the message we proclaim outside of these walls. God, ask this something, and you will speak through me that these words will be yours. And God, let anything that's not from you, let that fall away like chaff. In Jesus' name, amen. Today already has been so exuberant and joyous and amazing. It's so good to see people who come home to visit families and have come to worship here together as a family. And yet, our way of celebrating Easter is, is very different than the way people celebrated Easter to begin with. Originally, it, it was mixed. There was joy, but the texts always say it was mixed with a bit of fear. A bit of wonderment, a bit of puzzling. Because even though Jesus had said, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, and three days later, later I'll rise from the dead, people kept thinking, is this another parable? What could this mean? When this time, in particular, Jesus was literally saying, no, really, in three days I will come back. And the people, the ones who followed after him, had so much trouble understanding that. Sometimes when something is so good, it's hard to believe that it's true. Very recently, there was a man out in the West who won one of the largest Powerball lotteries of all time. But he didn't come forward to claim his ticket for three months. Even when he came forward, because they make you have your picture taken, he put on sunglasses and a ball hat because he didn't want people to know who he was. And when they asked him in the interview that you're required to give, why did you take so long to come forward? He said, for days, I stared at that ticket, and I stared at the winning numbers, and I just couldn't believe I won. Sometimes, in the midst of something truly amazing, we have difficulty accepting it and celebrating it. 
See, now we know the resurrection. We know everything that's happened and that's been done for us because we've seen more of the story. We've had more revealed to us. But at first, there's a great cause of mystery and wonderment and fear mixed with a definite sense of joy. Because remember, just a few days before, these people had watched their Messiah be taken by the temple guard. Some of them had the courage to follow at a distance to see the mock trial that he went through, and one disciple, the disciple John, was even at the crucifixion with the women, faithful, faithful women, who were always with Jesus, even with the other disciples, the male disciples, weren't. And they saw their Messiah, the hope they had for their nation, the hope they had for the kingdom of God. They saw this man killed. And not killed in any sort of pleasant way, but in one of the worst deaths possible. In fact, Scripture says that to die upon a tree is a curse. One of the worst ways for someone to die, according to the Old Testament law, was to die upon a tree. And here was Jesus hanging on wood, hanging from a tree, dying. Now, because of the time that he had died, people hadn't had time to do the normal rituals and routines that people do when someone's passed away. We have our own rituals and routines when people pass away now, and they did too. And so because of that, the Sabbath was coming, they, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't buy the spices and the oils that they would need. And then on, remember, the, the, the Jewish people, even now, they mark their days, night begins the day, daytime, and the sun set ends uh, the day. And so on Saturday night, you can probably assume that was when they were able to do some business, buy these herbs, and then early Sunday morning, just as the light's shining, these faithful women, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, <laughs> start going to the tomb. And then Matthew says that there was an earthquake as the angel rolled back the stone. Matthew also records that at the crucifixion itself there was an earthquake. Because Jesus' death and resurrection were something that were felt, was felt throughout the entirety of creation. Because when Christ died and, comes, and they came back to life, he didn't just redeem us, he redeemed all of God's creation and the earth tremored in response to that. There had been guards stationed at the tomb because there was a rumor this guy has said he's going to come back from the dead. And just to make sure that that doesn't happen, we're afraid really that his disciples are going to come and steal his body and then say he was raised from the dead. So they put guards at the tomb to keep people out. And the text says that when they saw the angel, as the angel rolled everything away, they were terrified. And Jesus announced, or excuse me, the angel was announced that Jesus the crucified one. He's risen. He's not here. Now what's amazing about that saying, Jesus who was crucified, it's a verb form in Greek that's one of past but continuing action. And so it doesn't just mean something that happened in the past and is done with, it means something that is permanent and in some sense always happening. This is why Jesus in his resurrection body has his wounds. In the new heavens and the new earth, Jesus will always bear the marks of crucifixion as a reminder for us, Jesus, the one who was crucified. He's not here. He's gone on just like he told you. And women went to tell the disciples. See, what Easter does what resurrection does is it flips everything you think completely on its head. But the people needed to have the full story in order to see that. When the British forces were fighting against the forces, the French forces under Napoleon, they didn't have, of course, cell phones or walkie-talkies or any other way to let people know news. 
And so as General Wellington was fighting the forces of Napoleon, there was a system that ships had to communicate with the land, with people on towers on the land. They had a system of spelling things out, and then as the ship would communicate a message to the tower, that tower would communicate the message to another tower, and then to another tower as far as the eye could see until eventually it made its way all the way back to London and to the king. And after this battle, the ship signaled to the tower, Wellington defeated. And the fog rolled in the way fog still exists in the UK. And so the tower received this message of Wellington defeated. And they passed the message along to the next tower, and to the next, and to the next. And the people for hours hear this, Wellington defeated. And they begin to wonder, what's going to become of us? What's going to become of our nation? What will Napoleon do next? General Wellington has been defeated. But a few hours later, the fall cleared, and the ship delivered the full message. Wellington defeated the enemy. It's a completely different message when you can see the entirety of it. And the disciples were living with only part of that message. Jesus died. And they lived with that for three days. Until they could then receive the whole message. Jesus died and has risen. See, what the resurrection does is it flips everything on its head. Everything we thought we knew is changed and transformed by the presence of God. What was dead is now alive. The soldiers who were stationed to guard the dead, now the text says, after seeing the angel, they were dead with fright. And what was dead is alive. Women were the witnesses of the resurrection. The first now let me tell you something. This was not an egalitarian society where people would say, oh yes, women, absolutely, this is a good story. We're, let's trust women. The law did not allow women to testify in court. There is one Jewish rabbi who wrote, now don't get upset with me, I'm just telling you. I didn't say this myself. But they said women can't be trusted because it's in their nature to lie and deceive. So having women be the first witnesses of the resurrection is not the way to tell a convincing story to a lot of people who would not esteem women. And yet, why would they tell it unless it were the historic truth? Women, this weaker sex in your minds, they're the ones God first entrusts with being his apostles, the ones who are sent to spread the message. Meanwhile, as far as flipping expectations on their head, where are the men hiding and cowering away inside? The resurrection flips everything on its head. Death now is life, and we can share in Christ's life by sharing in his death. See, these women, they didn't come to the tomb to witness a miracle. They came to mourn the loss they had suffered. The loss of their friend, of their rabbi, the loss of their hope. How do you mourn the loss of your hope? But God interrupted their requiem. And that is what the resurrection does. Even for us now, it interrupts what we think we're doing. The reasons we think we're going somewhere, and it turns those things wonderfully to God and God's purposes. At one time, I was so set, I'm going to become a doctor. And I got into medical school, and that's what I'm going to do. And then the, an experience with the Spirit of God led me to this instead. And I would choose this life every time based on that. You have experiences, I'm sure, when you have felt God leading you in a certain direction, where you thought things were going to go one way, and then after prayer and time you know, with other Christians that you trust, things just went a different direction. That is what the resurrection does. It turns everything on its head, and it's never finished with you. No matter where you think you're going, 
with the rest of your days, the spirit of the resurrected Christ from his alive in your heart will lead you and transform you and flip all of your expectations on their head. Because the spirit of the resurrected Christ, what it does is it, it gives us hope. It restores hope. And it speaks to the hope that is present within us and within nearly every person who has ever existed on this earth, no matter the religion or the time. The hope, the intuitive sense that this life is not all that there is. That there's got to be more than just this. We yearn for it to be true in a way that we sense that we just know it's not. It's not just wishful thinking. We are meant for more than this, and the resurrection proclaims that intuitive truth loud and clear. Because at the resurrection, Jesus defeated death. And we get to share in that. But what does any of this mean, any of it, if it doesn't impact your life? If it doesn't have some sort of personal meaning to you? What good is the resurrection if you're not taking it upon yourself to get to know this God more? To try to die to yourself a little bit every day so that the spirit of the resurrected Christ can grow within you. Because when those people had an experience, when those women had an experience with the resurrected Christ, Jesus didn't say, that's good for you, and let's keep it to ourselves now. He said, go and tell people. Tell the, the, the other disciples. Tell my brothers and my sisters that I am risen. We've become so accustomed to this idea that it stopped striking us as amazing. We are so far separated from it that we obviously don't have eyewitnesses anymore. But at that time, people would say, I saw this. I saw Jesus. He is back. And that fervor has spread this faith, as the spirit of the resurrected Christ has appeared to people said countless times since, and not in the same way he appeared to the disciples, but, but often God appears to us through that inner stirring of our spirits, through the fellowship we have of one another, through the ways that he helps us and blesses us. And all of that is meaningful because we testify to it, because we spread it. God is a God who interrupts our requiems, whether it's for him as the disciples, excuse me, the women at the tomb we're doing, the requiems for what we thought our lives to be, or just the little pity parties we throw for ourselves. God is much bigger than all these things. And his great love and his great kindness invites you to be a part of that journey too. So let us be like the women who had their expectations flipped. Let us joyfully spread the word that Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.